Welcome everyone. This is Debbie Mayberry with National Kitchen and Bath Association. You're here for our final webinar of the month on storage design trends. And today's session is called The Importance of Functional Hardware, Designing from the Inside Out with Karen Smith. She's with uh, Blum Incorporated and she's going to present. But before she gets started, I just wanted to thank Hedick for their generous sponsorship for all of our webinars for the month of October and uh, to thank uh, Dimitru and Felicitas for being with us as well this month. And Karen, we're ready to get started. Thanks so much. Thanks, Debbie. Um, hey, everyone, welcome. I uh, don't know if you were on earlier when Debbie um, was talking about the crazy weather, but I'm here in North Carolina and we just had a tropical storm move through. So we had a lot of um, down trees and there are power outages everywhere. So I hope that things are safe where you are. Um, and so I'm really glad to be able to join today and that you're here uh, with us. So we'll just go ahead and jump right in. Um, like Debbie mentioned, my name is Karen and I work with Bloom within our marketing communications team. Um, if you don't know Bloom, we manufacture products and solutions for cabinetry like uh, hinges and drawer runners, box systems, lift systems, uh, and drawer organization products. And one of the topics that I take care of is our research. And because of this, um, my specialty really lies in understanding um, how to choose the right cabinet or the cabinets for the space. Um, Bloom is constantly doing research in kitchens and other parts of the home um, to continue to provide products that help homeowners not only get the most out of their space, but have an enjoyable experience in their kitchen. Um, so we go about this research in several different ways uh, to find out what actually goes on in kitchens and see what users really want. We keep pretty close tabs on kitchen users. Um, we do kitchen observation studies, for example, um, and we just did a project uh, in the United States. Uh, we visited homes all across the United States, whether it was big cities or small towns, uh, to take a look at really how people are using their kitchens. We noted things like what do they keep where, what hardware is in their cabinets, what space is available, what does the room look like, um, we have conversations with them about what they love or hate about their kitchen, what they wish that they could change. And then at the end, we set up um, a camera and we actually film them uh, making a meal and doing everyday tasks. We ask them, you know, if they have groceries to unload, can we please get that? Throwing things away in the trash can, uh, emptying the dishwasher. And we take all this information and send it back to our research and development team um, back in Bloom, Austria, where Bloom is headquartered. I've also been a uh, part of trainings with Bloom's Age Explorer suit. Bloom owns the rights to this suit within the kitchen industry. It was developed by a team of geriatric researchers over in Germany, and it, it simulates physical limitations so that wearers can actually experience what it's like to cook with physical limitations. Um, and special needs that they may have in older age. Um, luckily, it's a combination of worst case scenarios of things that may happen to you, but um, we never know what may happen to our bodies as we age. Um, so the way that it works is, uh, I'll kind of go through this image from left to right. So you attach bindings to your knees and elbows to restrict joint movement. Um, the suit itself has special stitching to restrict movement and it kind of like hunches your shoulders down. Um, then 13 pounds of weights are added to the places that we naturally lose muscle mass over the years, uh, arms, shins, thighs. Uh, special gloves are worn to simulate decreased sensitivity in fingertips and arthritis. Earmuffs are used to change the way that we hear. Glasses are worn to simulate the visual acuity of an average 65 year old. And lastly, um, a visor is worn that not only limits peripheral vision, but also adds a yellow tint um, to change the way that we see color. Um, so our researchers wear the suit when developing our products to make sure that um, no matter what product we put out, it's usable for people of all ages and abilities. 
Uh, when designing a kitchen, it's important to keep in mind that kitchens can last for 20 or more years. So the kitchens our clients are asking for in their 30s and 40s are going to feel much differently um, when they get to their 50s, 60s, 70s. And wearing this suit, um, maybe you've even been in it yourself, uh, can help designers and architects design spaces that their clients will be uh, comfortable in at any age, especially now um, with all the universal design and aging in place. That's a really popular topic in the industry right now. What our clients don't think about too often is that there are two sides to every kitchen. Um, there's the there's the beautiful side that brings together all the right textures of a design, right? Um, and how it looks and feels. Um, but then there's also the functional side of the kitchen. Um, and today we're gonna go into the functional side of the kitchen. I'd like to really dive deep into that with you and even go as far as how we move around in our kitchens. So our friends at um, Blue UK developed this kind of mind map. And as you can see, it's very overwhelming. But this graphic actually represents all the things that homeowners have to decide or think about when designing or remodeling a kitchen. The decisions range from what kind of stove am I gonna have? What color faucet do I want to think about? What kind of countertop material do I need? Um, hardly ever does the homeowner think about what kind of hardware they want inside of their cabinets. Um, they're becoming more educated to know uh, soft or silent clothes, but that's typically as far as it goes. And we know from Ricky, the Research Institute for Cooking and Kitchen Intelligence studies, um, the number one regret in kitchen modeling is cabinet choice. So what do we know about functional hardware? Um, at Bloom, we know that it has to go with any trend, no matter if that trend is traditional or modern or a mix of the two. Uh, we know that we would like it to not be seen because we don't want to distract from the beauty of the cabinets. We know we need solutions for different types of cabinets, um, even face frame, frameless, inset. And we know that it should have good quality and that it should last as long as your cabinets, which as I mentioned before, 20 plus years. But how important is functional hardware? Um, you know, for many homeowners, hardware can make or break a kitchen, right? It can be a difference between a kitchen that you love and a kitchen that you love to work in. We spend more than 300 hours a year in our kitchens just preparing meals, so it might as well be a joy an enjoyable experience for our clients. Ricky and Ray Ward did a study and found that of those who made kitchen improvements in 2018, 44% of homeowners say that they would spend more money if they could do it again. 60% of these people did a full remodel and had a fairly large budget. 65% <clears throat> used a designer, while 35% just went through a contractor and 30% used an architect. So when designers are asked, or were asked, excuse me, what the top homeowner trade-offs were when splurging. 37% of designers said uh, functional hardware, but designers agreed that they are worth the spin, saying that many clients often wish that they would have gotten the soft closed drawers, more rollouts, or lazy Susans. Uh, designers also said that homeowners don't realize that getting cheaper cabinets would not last as long had they just upgraded to an all wood cabinet and did not realize this until after the mistakes were made. <clears throat> so also today, I hope that we can help you learn to um, reduce that regret as it relates to hardware. So we're going to look at some priorities to focus on with your clients to help build confidence in their decisions and ultimately solve their problem, making them happy with their remodel. There are three major categories of highly functional kitchen, and that is workflow, space, and motion. We'll get to all three first, but first, uh, I'd like to talk about workflow. When we take a step back and look at our kitchen observation videos, uh, we really saw that people all over the world shared the same typical workflows in the kitchen. And they've been doing that for years, right? Whether it's putting away groceries, emptying the dishwasher, 
um, even cooking a meal. And studying workflows in the kitchen is not a new concept. In 1912, Chris Christine Frederick conducted a string study research project, which related to the placement of kitchen cabinets and devices. And this study really helped show the unnecessary walking paths when working in a kitchen. Uh, she published these findings in Ladies Home Journal. And in 1940, is when the um, when the kitchen triangle came along, and the idea for that was introduced by the University of Illinois School of Architecture, um, and its hope was to maximize the functionality of the kitchen. And they recognized three main functions of the kitchen being storage, preparation, and cooking. Um, and the places for these functions should be arranged in the kitchen in such a way that. Work at one place does not interfere with work at another place, and the distance between these places is not unnecessarily large with any obstacles in the way. But when we take a closer look at what activities are carried out in the kitchen and what we store in the kitchen, we can actually divide it into more, um, more than three areas. Um, and it works with or against the kitchen triangle, no matter how you feel about that. Um, there are actually five and we call them zones at Bloom. So food storage, tableware storage, um, cleaning, preparation, and cooking. And the idea behind these zones is as simple as store like things together and where they make sense for the kitchen user. When things aren't stored together or with mixed zones as we call it, um, users walk approximately 866 feet per day which is nearly 1200 miles over the course of 20 years. And to put that in perspective, that's about the same distance as walking from Birmingham, Alabama to Boston. Um, but if you lay out a kitchen where everything is stored together, users only have to walk about 950 miles over the course of 20 years or 25% less than a kitchen where all the zones are mixed up. Even something as simple as placing the pantry beside the fridge can make a huge difference um, when you think about putting away the groceries or getting things out needed to make a meal. You're not having to walk from one side of the room to the other. You can save up to 10% of your steps. We can look at this case study as an example. Um, this was the original layout of the kitchen and the homeowner came to a designer and wanted to update their kitchen. They didn't like the layout, but they wanted to keep the sink and the dishwasher in the same place. They were willing to get rid of the wall beside the refrigerator and extend the wall behind it if needed. Um, this is the overhead view of their current layout. And so I'd like for us to walk through consider making, considering making a sandwich in this kitchen. So if we were to make a sandwich, we would get lunch meat and condiments out of the refrigerator and bread out of the pantry. We'd walk over and grab a plate and a knife to make the sandwich. We'd take the lunch meat back to the refrigerator, the bread back to the pantry, grab our sandwich and our knife, drop the knife off at the dishwasher or the sink, and then walk out of the kitchen. So after talking to their designer about um, the workflow in this kitchen, this is what they had determined for the final layout. So if we look at this kitchen and try to make a sandwich in this new kitchen, we get the lunch meat and condiments out of the refrigerator, the bread out of the pantry, We'd walk over to get a plate and a knife to make the sandwich. We take the bread back to the pantry and the lunch meat back to the fridge. Grab our sandwich and our knife. Drop the knife off at the at the sink and then walk out of the kitchen. So other than aesthetics, um, really it didn't appear too different, but the cabinet selection and placement really made all the difference in the world in this kitchen. Um, and as you can see, we can greatly reduce the footsteps and increase the convenience um, and really ultimately save the kitchen user time.
Now we understand that when planning workflows, it isn't always possible because to change around appliances because of plumbing um, and some things just can't be moved, but still just thinking about choosing cabinets that help store the items that are needed in that area of the kitchen. When working in the kitchen um, at Bloom, we, we kind of uh, relate workflow to convenience. We've already talked about why it's important to store items conveniently to where they will be needed. There's a whole other side of that, which is the ease of access. Um, our kitchen observation studies led us to studying postures uh, when retrieving items in the kitchen. And we measured these postures with the Oveco Working Posture Analysis System, or OWAS, that has been widely used to identify and evaluate harmful working postures. Um, these codes have 84 standard po posture combinations, four back, three arm, and seven legs postures. And the system reveals the frequency and relative proportion of time spent in specific postures and assessments by a four level scale of harmfulness. Um, and that's really like, you know, if you're crouching down and it's uncomfortable, the urgency in which you're, um, in which you want to correct that posture, you know, you want to stand back up and not be in a squatting position. So this is especially important to think about when we think about like I said before, how long our kitchen lasts. So crouching down to dig through layers of storage items may not be all that inconvenient in our 30s and 40s, but how it feel up into our 50s and 60s and beyond, especially thinking about uh, people that may have had knee replacements or, you know, just other injuries that have sped up the loss of muscle mass. So where is the optimal place to store items? Um, we think of that in two ways, by frequency of access and what hardware is planned in the cabinets. So in this diagram, what you're looking at is a partial extension drawer on top of a door with two shelves. And the red portion indicates where infrequently items should be stored in relation to the ergonomics of reaching that item. So the blue area of this, uh, this particular image indicates where easily accessible items should be stored. And the yellow indicates um, something somewhere between the two. So if we switch to a cabinet that looks like this um, with partial extension drawers, the frequently used items were accessible toward the front and top two drawers with the less frequently used items in the back of these two drawers and in the bottom drawer. But if we plan for full extension hardware in base cabinets, uh, frequently used items are more easily accessible in the top two drawers and reaching items on the bottom layer becomes much easier than a typical um, door shelf option that you see. So this is really where we can start planning kitchens for our clients from the inside out and individualizing a kitchen to your clients. Um, most designers like you uh, probably even have a list of questions that they ask their clients before getting started on a project. And as we get further into our talk today, I'd like for you to keep that list of questions um, in mind and think about what you could add to that list to dig deeper and to, know, to knowing how your client uh, prefers to use their kitchen. You know, it could be things like, does your client prefer to bulk shop with everything that's um, been going on in our world today with um, this coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic, we're seeing people um, bulk shopping. So perhaps they buy bulk meat and separate it and refreeze it. If so, it may be important to plan a freezer bag drawer in the pantry. That way when they're putting together or I'm sorry, putting away their groceries, they have ease of access to the bags and can separate and store the meat right there without running back and forth all over their kitchen. And going along with that same thought, not only is it important to store items where it makes sense, like the pantry um, by the fridge or the pots by the stove, it's also important to think about what level items are stored in the kitchen. For example, a toaster oven. <laughs> and I love this example because during our kitchen observations, 
we had a lady that stored her toaster on the bottom shelf of her base cabinet um, in the very back. And she even stored it in a shoebox for crumbs, to catch all the crumbs, which I thought was so adorable. Um, and we asked her, how often do you use this toaster? And she said, well, I use it at least once a day when making breakfast. And she would get down on her hands and knees, dig through her Tupperware, get it out, and then put it back up every day. And, you know, we were like, wow, that seems like a lot of work. Why, why did you choose to store it there? And she said, well, I've never really thought about it, but that's where my mom always had it in her kitchen. And I think that that is a common thing. Like even in my house, when I was unpacking my kitchen, I caught myself doing that, you know, at my mom's house. The cups are always beside the fridge because that's where you get ice and your drinks at. Um, and the dishwasher is all the way across the room. So when you're emptying the dishwasher of the cups, you're constantly having to cross back and forth um, across the room. So it's really interesting to hear people's reasonings for why they store things where they do and kind of get them into thinking storing things where they make the most sense to reduce the amount of work that they end up having to do in their kitchen. So you can use this chart to um, talk to your clients about this and even maybe create a blueprint which we'll see later for storage goods with your clients. Um, because that can be quite overwhelming or you just end up storing things where your mom did. Um, but if you had a blueprint of what cabinet should hold what and you know it's going to make working in your kitchen easier, that's something that they're probably going to tell their neighbors about um, and get their neighbors excited about redoing their kitchen. So moving on to the second cornerstone of a highly functional kitchen is space. Um, there's nothing that a functional kitchen needs more than enough space. I'm sure you guys hear that all the time. We at Bloom hear it a lot. Um, my kitchen doesn't have enough space. I need more storage space. Um, there's nothing worse than your client finding out that they don't have enough space for everything when they're ready to move back into their new kitchen, right? Um, it's a problem, like I said, that you've heard often. And Bloom's research shows that 66% of people want more accessible storage space. And as much as 80% of those people uh, probably store kitchen items in other parts of the home. Um, like the frequency for storage needs differ from homeowner to homeowner. So do space requirements. Um, it depends on their lifestyle, their cooking and their shopping cabinet, uh, habits, whether they've got a big family or a small family. Maybe they're living in a multi-generational home. Maybe their kids are, having to remote learn from college. Um, there are all kinds of factors that go into it. Um, if they don't cook or have a lot of space, um, they would probably choose a narrow spice drawer and the owner, um, sorry, I seem to have missed a slide. <laughs> um, okay, so here's my narrow spice drawer. Um, and if they have a lot of pots and pans, you know, you can consider a wider drawer for that. And then, like I said, the pantry, depending on if they bulk shop or if they don't. And I'd just like to go back to show you this slide of the top regrets. Um, as you can see, storage and organization is at the top of the list of top regrets. And with cabinets being 30% of people that redid a kitchen in 2018 regretted their cabinet choice. So just moving forward, sorry about that. Um, we know that we can't always change floor plans to get a bigger kitchen footprint. Um, and we know that there are cabinet standards in place, right? And they've been in place since 1932, actually, um, by President Hoover when he created the Committee on Household Management um, to standardize the, heart, the art of home building. Um, so the things that are standard, um, as you guys know, cabinet width, you know, three inch increments, the height, sink depth even, cabinet arrangement, stove placement, cabinet materials, countertops, work surfaces, all of these things were analyzed um, and many of those standards were set into place then and very few changes actually have been made since then. But there are a few things that we can do 
uh, to sneak more space into our kitchens without having to change the size of the room. For example, you may be able to fit a lot into two narrow drawers, but if you combine the two, you could actually get up to 15% more storage space within that drawer. Um, or if you think about a narrow top drawer, if you made that into a deeper drawer, you could get up to 55% more storage space in that drawer. So really cabinet, sele cabinet selection um, plays a huge difference in sneaking space uh, out of your kitchen or out of your client's kitchen. Even um, storage solutions themselves can open up for the opportunity for more storage space. Um, typically, the space is lost around the sink, um, the space under my sink. There's no telling what's under there. <laughs> um, and I have to keep my drain plug, sponges, dish soap, all that stuff on the counter because there's not a really good place to store those items. But if you're looking at the image on the right, what if you had this type of cabinet? The space that's lost around the sink typically uh, can really be put to good use and get those items that you want to clear off your countertop um, hidden away. It can be used for things like dishcloths or sponges, vegetable scrubbers, all those kinds of things. Now there are certain things to keep in mind with this application. Um, the cabinet has to be approximately 12 inches wider than the width of the sink bowl um, to accommodate the U shape. Um, or thinking about if there's a garbage disposal in that sink, it uh, might not work with this solution, but it's still a useful application for a smaller bar sink or even thinking about a bathroom vanity. And with the corner solution, instead of your typical lazy Susan style cabinet, um, if you have a drawer bank of full extension drawers, you could get everything that's in a lazy Susan into this cabinet and even possibly an added layer or two of storage space. So what does this tell us for how to choose our cabinets? Well, first let's talk about what might fit into each cabinet because that's really where you can start choosing what cabinet would work best. Um, so what you see here is cabinets that are in a typical spec book. And if you show this to your clients, could they visualize what to put in them? Probably not. Um, and that's, that's something that you can help them with. So first let's look at the available space and how large typical storage items are. And then we'll compare that to how much space is available in these cabinets and keeping in mind um, what level something fits versus if it makes sense there. So if we take a look at this drawer base um, and think about where it will be placed in the layout, what storage items are needed for that area of the kitchen. Will this cabinet suit those storage items? Is it wide enough? Are the drawers deep enough? And the items in gray do, would not fit in this cabinet. Uh, same for this cabinet, the items in gray would not fit in this cabinet. Two deep drawers, so you can get um, a lot of goods into that cabinet. And then this is a special cabinet because it's one that um, is really popular in kitchen layouts. But what can we actually store in there? We could put uh, dish towels and flatware and utensils in this cabinet. But what would you put um, in the smaller spaces on the bottom level? Would your client need access to it often? Do they want to bend down and get it all the time? And this is some sometimes how we can rule out certain cabinets out of a spec book. Organization also super important. Um, you know, making sense of what is gonna be stored in that drawer without taking up more space than necessary. Um, and as you can see in this image, deep drawer organization is also possible. So it's important to choose organization items that ensures that everything has its place, even when storage goods change. Um, or for things like lids to plastic containers using deep drawer organization. A place can be created, you know, where everything's within sight and within reach. And I don't know about you, but I have some drawers at home that aren't very organized and things are much harder to see and retrieve. 
uh, and by using full extension drawers, the entire contents of the drawer comes out, eliminates the need to dig through layers of items on a shelf, and you're able to easily see everything in, in the light. There are so many different um, kitchen gadgets and utensils. It really reinforces the idea to have adjustable organization. Um, these storage goods aren't gonna last 20 years probably, right? You're gonna have to switch them out at some point. Um, if one breaks and the kitchen user has to buy one to replace it, it may not be guaranteed that the new item will be the same size. So adjustability is really important um, when talking through how to organize everything with your clients. Like I said, at my house, my junk drawer looks more like the image on the left. Uh, organized junk drawer may be unheard of to a lot of people, um, but thinking about older people through our research with our Age Explorer suit, if they have decreased sensitivity in their fingertips, having sharp things in the drawers um, in their own designated section really may not be such a bad idea. And you know, not only for older people, but for kids too that are digging through, um, we, we don't wanna cause unnecessary harm. Thinking about um, lifting plates into a wall cabinet versus lowering them into a drawer. Um, it's much easier to lift from a base cabinet to the countertop than the countertop over your head. So imagine your, your grandmother putting away her plates, um, a plate holder for a base cabinet really makes it easier for people to grasp and lift out of a drawer. Um, and you know, that's not something that we see very often. I had never heard of this or even thought about it before someone brought it to my attention. And, and I think it's a really smart idea. Um, you can find plate storage with rubber grips so the plates aren't like sliding around in the drawer. Um, so really something to think about talking to your clients about. And also talk to them about, um, like I said before, what they wanna store in their kitchen and asking if they have anything tucked away in the garage or basement that they'd really like to have in their kitchen and prioritizing that um, when you're planning their layout. And when you ask them these questions, uh, that's really when you begin building a relationship with your client and them opening up to you and trusting you and possibly referring you to their friends who are so excited to see their new kitchen. So now that we've looked at storage goods and sizes and organization, um, to go along with all of that, consider the area of the kitchen that the items need to be used and um, what items need to be stored within those cabinets. So remembering our zones from the workflow uh, portion earlier in the webinar, um, we can cr actually create zoned cabinets. And we can rule out which cabinets don't make sense for a functional kitchen, like we talked about um, this cabinet. There are not enough of any storage items from any of the zones to fill this one cabinet. So once you've identified cabinets based on zone and what storage items are gonna go in there, you could even think about offering a packaged cabinet solution for your clients. Um, and what I mean by that is you would set the price for the cabinet to include everything that you see um, from the external aesthetic options to the inner workings of the drawers and even possibly the organization systems. And what this means for you is no more upselling. So you would leave it to the homeowner to remove the organization items they don't want. However, once someone is sold on the idea of a completely organized kitchen, no more kneeling and stretching into a cabinet, um, deciding what items to take out will become a really tough choice for them. I mentioned before creating a blueprint of storage goods for your clients uh, for when their kitchen is complete. So imagine handing them something like this to remind them where they could put everything and where it should be stored. You've made it easier for them um, to put their kitchen together unpacking their kitchen when they begin to move um, back into their kitchen. And what's even better is there will be space for everything. And with that, 
we'll move into our final cornerstone of a functional kitchen, which is motion. And what I really mean by motion when it comes to kitchens uh, is quality. When cabinets open easily and run smoothly and have that soft, nice close, no matter how much weight is in the drawer, that's really the hallmark of a functional kitchen. Um, and when quality hardware is used, it's gonna last 20 or more years. There's, there's that comfort level knowing that they're gonna have that kitchen and be able to use it for a long time. All in all, um, kitchen drawers, doors, and wall cabinets are open and closed more than 80 times a day. Um, and if we add that all up, that is about 30,000 times each year. Um, the refrigerator alone is open and closed 30 times a day. So when working in our kitchens, keeping all this in mind is really important because we want, we want the cabinets to be easy to open. Um, you know, even if it is, a heavy drawer, we want it to open easily and glide smoothly with a pull or a knob. Um, for handleless designs, your clients could choose between a mechanical or electrical assisted opening. Um, even if it's not all the drawers, maybe it's just your, your waste recycle drawer, knowing how many times you throw something away a day. Um, I like to use the example of chicken guts because that's the grossest thing to me. And when I cook with chicken, I am a nut about disinfecting everything that I've touched. But if I had a waste cabinet, um, a touch to open waste cabinet in my kitchen, I could just bump the front with my knee, have the drawer come open to me, dump the guts and not contaminate multiple surfaces in my kitchen. We want our drawers to be easy to operate. So smooth running action is important, even if there's a lot of weight in the drawer, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and upper cabinets, wide or heavy fronts should open smoothly and stop at any position. And we want our drawers to be easy to close, right? Um, homeowners are becoming aware of the soft side clothes and are asking for that. So now they have pretty much become a standard in all mid to high end kitchens. So whether it's drawers or doors and they're light or heavy and no matter how hard you slam them, they should close quietly, softly, and all the way with that single push. So now that we've talked about the ins and outs of workflow space in motion, let's focus on how it can help you set, set yourself apart from your competition. Um, think about what sets you apart from your competition right now. Is it the door styles that you offer? Is it your paints, finishes, and glazes? Um, do you set yourself apart by your price? Are all of these things pretty much in line with your competitors? If you adopt any of the principles that we talk about today, um, you can really set yourself apart by providing a much more functional kitchen for every person that you work with, which creates more value for your client and in turn for yourself. We know that word of mouth advertising is the most influential kind of advertising. 75% of people don't believe advertisements, but 92% of people believe uh, brand recommendations from friends. Um, think about Amazon reviews. I, I read reviews before I buy anything personally. Um, word of mouth advertising generates two times more sales than paid ads and people are four times more likely to buy when referred from friends. So you can think about it like this. You have roughly 30 inches of space to create something unique for the homeowner. Um, while aesthetics partly make a kitchen unique, what really individualizes one kitchen to the next are the items the user needs to store and how they want to work in their kitchen. So you could create this cabinet with a pair of runners and four hinges or you could give them a cabinet like this, a cabinet that would better suit their needs and one that they want to show off to their friends. Would you buy a car based on a drawing or without driving it first? Of course you wouldn't. Um, you want the, to know the car suits your needs, that the controls are easy to reach and make sense in the placement. You want to ensure that there are enough cup holders where you need them for your family 
that the seats are going to be comfortable for long drives, but durable enough to withstand daily use. And if we don't buy a car without testing it out first, why would we expect consumers to buy a kitchen based on a rendering? So I would like to talk to you about how your showroom displays could help customers visualize what they're paying for. What you see here is what we call a good, better, best display. Um, it features an example of good planning, better planning, and the best planning. Um, it shows partial extension versus full extension with organization. It shows ergonomics and accessibility. You could even prop each level the same and ask consumers to take something out of the good option and out of the best option so they can see for themselves how much easier drawers and base cabinets are. It can show storage ideas and ease of access to the cabinets. And with doors, they, it can show, you know, they block or open into neighboring cabinets, or you can have a solution that um, the doors open up and out of the way, giving you full access to your cabinets. You could implement something like a comparison display. The exact same storage items can be found in both of these, um, both of these displays. We point out the space usage and storage options between the two cabinets. Um, you know, have, how them walk through emptying the dishwasher with those doors overhead and how they open versus emptying the dishwasher uh, with a door that lifts up and out of the way. Here's where you can do your uh, chicken gut waste bin um, simulation. Have them pick up a handful of ping pong balls and try to throw something away in the waste cabinet on the left versus, you know, bumping their knee against the door on the, on the right and having the trash can come out to them. And even if you don't have the room to set up these kinds of displays, maybe there's displays that you can piece together throughout your um, showroom to kind of just have them walk through the different scenarios and really get them seeing how much easier a functional kitchen design would be for them. The University of Rochester School of Medicine uh, published an interesting study a few years ago based on brain activity imaging. And what it did was revealed emotions that are an undeniable part of the decision-making process. Um, in fact, if you eliminate the emotional guiding factors, it's impossible for people to make decisions in daily life. Um, so people with damaged prefrontal lobes, um, that's the area of the brain where emotions are processed. They're completely mystified when it comes to making personal decisions such as scheduling a doctor's appointment, wearing a seatbelt, and even um, deciding what to buy for themselves. So when humans make personal decisions, they put themselves in the picture and evaluate the emotional risks or benefits of making that decision. If they can't grab onto that emotional image and can't place themselves in it, they cannot make the decision. That's why you always have to appeal to the emotions when you're talking to your clients. It's not facts that convince customers to go with your company, it's emotions. Uh, in fact, former marketing executive for Nike and Starbucks, uh, Scott Bedberry once said, a great brand taps into the emotions. Emotions drive most, if not all of our decisions. Think about this, what industry has showrooms without salespeople that consistently, even daily, get consumers to buy items they didn't want or didn't plan to buy? It's a grocery store, right? The products sell themselves. We always go to the grocery store and pick up things that we did not come there to buy. And it all comes down to visualization because consumers aren't able to visualize much. If I said pots and pans cabinet, what do you imagine? Do you think that one of your clients would imagine the same thing? Could you store other things in there besides pots and pans? Um, you really sell products based on the way that you promote them. And I've been in numerous showrooms and I've seen this, um, which is empty drawers and impersonal spaces. 
And honestly, if I didn't work at Bloom, I would have no idea what I was looking at. It looks sterile. Um, it looks like it belongs in a doctor's office, to be honest with you. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen counter samples and invoices, broken light bulbs, counter decorations, um, all that kind of stuff in, in these drawers. And we need to keep in mind that consumers don't know what they're looking at. And if they don't know what they're looking at, they can't know what they're paying for. And how can we expect them to get as excited as we get about this stuff when we can't show them how awesome it really is? So thinking back um, to the supermarket example, and then with this example, this is the, a drawer with the exact same organization in it. And you can see the difference, right? It costs a little bit of money to prop a cabinet in, the show, in your showroom, um, but you can do this over time. You can save empty boxes from home and tape up the openings. Um, you can pick up little things here and there over time and it will make a huge difference. This is an example of a showroom with the drawers empty. And then how much better does this look? Um, this is the, show, the showroom fully propped and it really makes all the difference in the world. And the sale is easier when the homeowner gets to walk in a showroom, open the cabinets, see items like theirs inside and experience the different solutions and products. When a consumer sees storage goods in a drawer, um, it really draws them in making that emotional connection that we talked about to the storage goods that they see. They can begin to relate to these items. Um, propping a showroom display is extremely important no matter what kind of displays are shown. And without props, a cabinet is just like every other cabinet and every drawer is just like every other drawer. Consumers expect to walk in a showroom and open a cabinet to see where the showroom stores their extra countertop samples. They expect to see cabinets with doors in a base unit. But what will stick in their minds if they walk in a showroom, pull open a drawer, see that U-base around the sink, or they open a wall cabinet with a lift system and are able to push a button to close it. Or if they see an automatic open with a push, um, push to open on a drawer front and can imagine their hands full of garbage in that uh, waste bin example that we talked about. These are experiences that will all help sell the homeowner on why they must have it in their kitchen. And you can even see it have an impact on your sales in the long run. Um, this example comes from Martin Layfield. And ever since he propped his showroom, he saw his sales jump from about 25% to 60%. So no matter how you choose to spice up your showroom, um, it's really important to remember that the traditional showroom of yesterday needs to meet the expectations of today's shopper. Um, we live in a Google society, right? Consumers are more educated than ever before and businesses are having to quickly adapt to the expectations of today's shopper, which is um, having something for them to experience and also entertain them. And by all means, and I'm not saying run out and change your entire showroom, but just think about your showroom and little differences that you can make here and there um, over time that really can help persuade consumers from a functionality standpoint and really tap into those emotions to help set yourself apart from your competition. Okay, I know that was a lot of information in the past um, past 50 minutes and I wanted to leave some time for some questions if you guys have them about uh, functional hardware. Um, so just we'll do a quick review of what we talked about today. Um, good quality hardware can make or break a kitchen design. So choosing hardware that can withstand up to 20 years of use in a typical kitchen. Um, designing from the inside out, really diving into clients' workflows, how they prefer to use their kitchen. Talking with clients to discover personal needs. For example, do they need an above average size pots and pans drawer because they love cooking? Um, prevent upselling by offering packaged cabinets complete with an uh, interior organization. Let the homeowner pick and choose what they would like to remove. Helping your clients create a blueprint for their kitchen after discovering what items should be stored where um, to help them remember when they're ready to unpack their new kitchen. Choosing wide or deep drawers to sneak more space out of a layout. 
And then thinking of some ways to spice up your showroom. Um, is it propping? Is it good, better, best, or comparison display to walk your clients through? Um, all these kinds of things will really show the impact of functional hardware and why it's important to think about that up front and just as important as the aesthetics of their kitchen. So with that, Debbie, I'll turn it back to you and see if we have any questions that I can help answer. Well, thank you so much, Karen. That's been so informative. Lots of research we can tell went into this and people have been making those comments. And it's been great to have you here. Um, so just before we get to the questions, though, I would like to have Dimitru uh, speak for a moment. So Dimitru, if you're available, if you could just say a few words, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Uh, what a great presentation. Very informative and uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, definitely a lot of work went into this presentation, so it, it was a pleasure to sponsor this. For those of you who are not familiar with Hedge, just wanted to give you a, a little bit of a little bit of history into Hedge. So Hedge is one of the uh, world's largest hardware manufacturer. So we, we manufacture quality functional hardware. We are family-owned company. We were established in Germany in 1888. Just a fun fact. We started manufacturing cuckoo clocks. And after that, we moved to piano hinges. And today we produce hinges, slides, drawer box system, sliding door system across all market segments um, from kitchen and bath, residential furniture, office, and also appliances. And we, we have manufacturing facilities in the US, Germany, Czech Republic, in Spain, in India, and China. So uh, if you want to find more information about us, you can um, go to our website, which is hedish.com. But again, uh, great, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. And uh, thank you so much, Hedic, for sponsoring all of our webinars this month. Really appreciate it. And now, Karen, we're going to get to the questions. <laughs> So here we go. Uh, let's see. So there was someone that said that they wanted me to ask their question. Her name is Doris because uh, she has to leave. So she's wondering about the, um, the rubber grips for dishes, their size for particular dishes, or are they adjustable? So those are um, the ones that I showed in the image were actually ones by Bloom. Um, there are plate holders. So they expand, they're adjustable. They go up to um, accommodate a 12 inch plate. And they had, they had the rubber grips on the bottom to help them keep from sliding around. Um, I'm not sure what other um, solutions are out there, but that is the one from Bloom. Okay, great. Thank you. And then Sandy says, um, do you have a Lazy Susan or other functional organizational item for a blind cabinet with a 15 inch door? We do not. Um, so at Bloom, we really just focus on the the slides, the hinges, and then the hardware for the lift up cabinets. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, so Stephanie says, can we get a copy of the decision matrix? Um, could it be made available on the website, on your website for as a downloadable PDF? Uh, she's saying this could help a designer ask the forgotten questions when designing a kitchen. That is a great idea. Um, we don't have a US specific version yet, but that is something that we could work on. And it's it's really helpful to hear that that would be helpful to, to you guys. So um, I'm gonna make a note to work on that. Okay, great, thank you. And then David says, how close is Bloom to introducing the space step in the United States? So it's actually um, in development and I, I don't know that I don't know the answer to that. Okay, that's good. Thank you. And then Tracy says, where might I find a copy of the mind map image that you showed earlier that shows the decisions involved in kitchen design? So I think that's the same thing that, um, from the same question that we had before. Um, so I really will work on creating a US specific version that we can download because that sounds like it's, it's a want by, by several of you, which is great. Good, 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 thank you. And then um, Anne says, suggestion for Bloom, base cabinet with bottom shelf uh, being a rollout or a drawer that will raise up when fully extended, like the wall cabinets have pull down shelves for easy access, that's that's a lot. <laughs> yes, but that's a good idea. And I'll, are we um, actually at Bloom have something where we can put ideas in for 
um, new products. So I will get that added. Great. Thank you. And then Laura, she's asking, what exactly does the top kitchen uh, regrets cabinets? And can that be broken down like finish function or however it could be broken down? Um, I do not have that research in front of me right now. Okay. But I can, I can look into it if you want to email me directly. Um, I can give out my email address and we can look into it together. Oh, okay. That sounds good. And then do you want to, do you want me to type in your email address here, Karen? Yes, or? that would be perfect. That way everyone. And it's Karen, it's Karen dot, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. What is Karen it? Karen dot Smith. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. At, at bloom.com. Okay. Let me put that into the text chat. There you go. Thank you for that. And so then you're, she's inviting people out in the audience to send her some questions. Um, but, you know, we want to be careful about Karen's time as well. So just, uh, you know, if you have something very, very specific that you'd like to contact Karen about, please do so. And then let's see. So Gina is saying, will speaker kindly cover the specifics, that'd be you, Karen, of touch latch tip on doors and drawers? Okay, so these are different. So for doors, we have our tip on system that you push on the door and the little tip on mechanism unlatches the door and then you finish opening it like with your hand. Um, for our drawers, we have what's called tip on blue motion. And it's a mechanical system that is attached to the runner itself and you push on the drawer. It opens out part of the way, not as much as with the um, electrical version. And then you're able to, I'm doing my hands like you guys can see me, but um, push it closed and it relatch. Um, I don't know if that answers all of your questions about it, but if you use my email, I can, um, I can point you into more information about it. Okay, that's great, Karen. Thank you. And then uh, another Anne, she's saying, I'm loving this webinar. So informative. Really appreciate all the research that has gone into this. So thank you. Um, and then Jessica says, love the drawer organization options. And uh, Gabriella, she says, where can we purchase the interior drawer organizers? We have a um, place on our website, a where to buy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it really just depends on the distributor in your area. Um, and if you need help or you can't find one around you that has the organizational systems, you can reach out to our customer care team. You can reach out to me and we'll point you in the right direction too. Okay, great. Thank you. And then Chanel says, could you review uh, the storage categories again, like food, tableware, et cetera? Would that be possible? Or do you think that they should just watch that portion of this recording? No, I can review it. So five, um, five zones, um, it's basically food storage. And that covers your, um, your pantry and your refrigerator. Then you have your tableware storage. So thinking about your plates, silverware, cups, that kind of thing. Cleaning, uh, your sink, your dishwasher, your waste cabinet. Preparation, all the um, tools that you'd use to prep a meal. And then cooking. So that's your oven, pots, pans, um, baking sheets, that kind of thing. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And then um, Anne says, what is the widest cabinet that Bloom suggests? So, so that really depends on what hardware you choose um, because different runners have different weight capacities. So it, it would depend on, you know, if you had like a Lego box, um, metal drawer system versus a wood drawer all those have different specs. And then we even have um, heavy duty runners and regular duty <laughs> for lack of better word. Um, so it really depends on what you're looking for. Okay, that's good. Um, I, there's a couple more questions, so I'm gonna keep going. Can you stay with us for a few more minutes, Karen? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so Laura's asking, She's wondering about the lift system hardware for upper cabinets. Do you offer anything for more transitional or traditional cabinetry designs? Yes, so that is the beauty of our hardware is that it works with no matter 
the design. So we have, we have solutions for both face frame and frameless cabinetry. Um, so really whatever front you wanna put on it, the hardware doesn't matter. It doesn't change that. Okay, that's good to know. And then uh, let's see, Tara wants to know, how do you get the lift up door down? Isn't it too high to reach? Great question. So the, the door will stop wherever you stop it. So if you lift it up to a certain position, it will stop right there. So it's in, within your reach. It won't like just spring up um, to the ceiling. Also, uh, if you have servo drive in that cabinet, um, you can place a button and you can touch on the front and have it open. And then you can push the button mounted wherever you want and it will close the cabinet for you. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there's um, someone else that's asking, well, what program do you use to make a blueprint of the kitchen storage? I think that was early on you showed that. Uh, yes, yeah. so I believe what that was um, created, like the background was created in 2020 and then brought over into, um, I guess, PDF layout and with the little icons just like put on. Oh, okay, great, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, I love that. I love the images where you're walking the footsteps through the kitchen and showing that. That was, that was so really interesting to see how much time is wasted. <laughs> yes moving around. Um, there's just about two more here, so I'll just keep going. Um, what is the highest weight capacity hinge offered by Bloom? I, I do not know the answer to that offhand. Okay, well that's something that maybe that's from Kay, so maybe Kay might want to reach out to you yeah. uh, in an email and we can, she can, you know, go further with that. And then here's another question for Stephanie. Um, do you have consultants who can help with selecting products for clients who need solutions for existing kitchen cabinets? If, if a designer has a question and wants to reach out, we can absolutely um, absolutely look into that. We're, we're not set up to um, answer questions by homeowners, um, but we can take it on a case by case basis, I think. Okay, Karen, that, that sounds great and I'm, I think we've come to the end of the question. So I want to thank you so much for this great presentation. It's been very, very well researched and really informative. I know lots of people are saying um, how much information they learned today in the in the comments here. And again, oh, I want to thank, oh yeah. I want to thank um, Hedick for generously sponsoring all of our webinars this month. And again, thank you, Karen, for your generous time and uh, all this great information you'd share with us today. And to all of you out there, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. You too.